What's happening, everyone? Welcome to the Sportcast. It's me, Andy Grant. We've got Gary Judge with me from Across the Park Podcast, and we're here to give you a roundup of sports and a look ahead this weekend. Don't forget our new sponsors are IGD, and you get 25% off if you type in Andy IGD at checkout. Some belter gear. I've just got my bundle of stuff. Gary, I will get yours sorted. But here's my package come, all my training gear, and uh, very grateful to have them supporting the pod. So go and get your 25% off. Right. Straight into it, mate, and I'm going to talk about my best mate, Emma Raducanu, only messing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I will, what I will mention though is um, it is good. I know me and you like our tennis when the big tournaments come around, and the Australian Open is might have actually just started, I think. And we have got Emma. Uh, she's playing Shelby Rogers, who actually she beat on her way to win the US title, which is interesting. I think that'll just be a really good. Um, what would you call it? like a benchmark, really, just to see where she is? Because obviously, a couple of years ago, she she you know, beat her on the way to winning. Obviously, she's had a horrendous year with injuries, a horrendous year, you know, for a few reasons. The last few years, I think this is going to be a great challenge for her. And what makes it quite spicy that if she actually beats uh, Shelby Rogers, she'll play the British number one in the next round. Uh, called mm-hmm. Kate Katie uh, Balter, I think her name is. Which is, I just think, be really interesting because you know the yeah, hype around. I mean, she's not around great. Casey Bath is not great, but well, she's listen. You know, she's Britain's number one, so I know she's know. Britain's number one. But, but you know, traditionally, with the greatest respect, that's until you know, rather can't really come along. It's not being the, the greatest um, yards that has it. The, no, the, yeah, the, I agree. Yeah, I, yeah, I'll uh, give you that. But yeah, I just oh, think no, so. you're right though. It is definitely an definitely an, an interesting one. It'd be a spicy one. So yeah, hopefully she gets two. And it's just a shame that the two Brits are going to play each other. And I think it's the third round because obviously one of them's going to be going out. But mm. yeah, I think it'll be a good game, um, kind of yardstick to see where Emma is in her recovery and whether she can, you know, take it one further. But I'm just buzzing that, you know, it's starting again. She's actually fifty to one to win the tournament. Emma Raducanu. Um, not a massive price that. Is it considering that considering that the awful run she's been on, the injuries she had and everything? But obviously as a former winner, then you you'd have to I'll be honest. small gone somewhere. When I was looking at it odds, I literally started at the bottom and worked my way up thinking it was gonna be five and one. And when I saw it fifty to one, I thought, you know, that there's no value. Not even worth it. I think we thought, yeah, it'd be quite funny just to see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a couple of quid at, you know, two hundred and fifteen mm-hmm. to one, maybe I would have had to go up, but I won't be touching it at fifty. Mm-hmm. Um over to the men. You've got uh, Novak uh, Djokovic, he's evens uh, to win. And if you want to keep it with the Brits, you've got Andy Murray at 300 to 1 to win the tournament. So, that, uh, that's mad. That, that's crazy, isn't it? Like Andy Murray's 300 to 1, and then Emma Azakar is 50 to 1. And Andy, Andy Murray, but, you know, compared to the last three years, has, has another bad year in terms of injuries and stuff. And and, and he's yeah. been competing with some of the best. You know, he, he took a step off um, Dimitrov, didn't he? I think in the the last tournament running into it. Mm. Yeah. So, mm, I mean, yeah. again, a, a 300, 300 to 1 is probably about right, but I think that 300 to 1 is probably what rather Carney should be as well. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I see in you a mention, which really interesting, I think it's brilliant. There's one on the uh, on the mums, let's say, of the tennis world as well, which I think is great, isn't it? Yeah, there'll be there'll be six 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 women who are basically playing in the, in the Australian Open, three of which have got a, a decent chance um, six women who've who basically got kids who've three of three of whom have recently had kids and are returning for their first I think their first major since having children. I've seen something which which was crazy, but then I guess believable given that most women traditionally in sports and in elite sports when they've had kids tend to kind of step back or retire or they do it towards the end of their career. But it's I, I was reading that um, it says yeah the returning trio of um, Azarenka. The returning trio and Azarenka will be accompanied by their children as they look to, to match the feat achieved by Yvonne Gulagong, get, Ka, uh, Gulagong Carly in 1977 and Kim Clijsters by being the only only women to hold aloft the um, Daphne Akers Memorial Cup as mothers. So there's only two two women who have ever won the Australian Open who were mothers, which That's which mad. is mad, isn't it? Like, it, you know, it's... Yeah. I guess we... You know, we take for granted, or women, I suppose, take for granted that, you know, they have kids and they get on with the work and life. You know, we, we sometimes forget that, you know, getting back to elite 
level of performance, having gone through what they, their bodies have gone through, is, is so deep. But to, to then go on and be a champion and be the best yeah. in the world on a, on a certain course, on a certain day, is, is remarkable. So, yeah, best of luck to the six who are involved, and it'll be interesting to see how they do. And obviously, it'll be a great advert for, for, for many women who are going to go through that point uh, through childbirth at one point in their life if they can then become yeah. champions after it. I did think the absolute beast actually Serena Williams tells a great story that I think she actually wins, I think it might be Wimbledon, whilst she was in the early stages of pregnancy. And she was kind of saying, you know, that like her and her daughter kind of won Wimbledon. She was kind of saying, you know, on a joke, which I just think which I just think is brilliant. So yeah, I know you like the tennis and I know we've got a few no, we'll, fans never, we'll, we'll, we'll never have that. We'll never be able to see. <laughs> that's one thing you'll never be able to do, Andy. You know, you like a challenge, but yeah. <laughs> you'll never be able to be be pregnant or to born well, a child. We're, we're going to speak a little bit about women on this pod as we come on to uh, maybe not just yet, but we come on to women and the whole women in sport. Mm-hmm. Thanks to uh, Joey Barton and, and the stuff he's brought up. But um, but yeah, no, brilliant for the mums there. And yeah, just buzzing that the Australian Open is starting. Uh, another thing that's Feels like it's only just started and it's already at the semi-finals. It's the snooker, the Masters on at the moment. Um, I think to Ronnie be fair as well, I, yeah, I've not actually watched it yet, but they've done a kind of a day in the life and Ronnie at the Masters, which I've not seen yet. It's like a bit of a vlog, yeah, vlog, um, which looks pretty good. And I did see one clip that he posted himself on um, Instagram. He's basically turning up at the Ali Pali, and the security guard is um, like basically saying, "Have you got your name?" And he's like. Yes, Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's like, I can't, he's like, I can't see your name on the list. And the poor, like, you know, <laughs> seventeen-year-old security guard is like, genuinely, like, going, you're gonna have to just wait here a minute. And then Ronnie's, <laughs> Ronnie's having a bit of a joke with him, saying, um, you know, I'm playing an half an hour, I'm gonna be late. Like, he was the, he was the. I reckon he thought it was a wind up, you know, like a bit of an Ant and Dex type thing. It, you know what? I think it's on his yeah. Instagram. So go back and have a look yeah, at Ronnie's well, Instagram. Well, I just thought that was brilliant and. Yeah, like you say, he's uh, he's into the semi-finals on Saturday. He was three twos out against Hawkins. He, mm-hmm. he was in a bit of trouble at one point, but he's obviously come back and won in the end. Um, but yeah, he, he looks he looks in good shape to be fair. Um, and it'll yeah. be a record, won't it? Yeah, it's eight, isn't it? I think. Yeah, it'll be a record if he if he wins it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, he's. Um, so. Yeah. No, it's. Uh... Well, then we run Neil Sullivan as as we've said, and, and as as we you know a lot of people have seen the documentary, and, and he admits himself when he's on it, when he fancies it, and when there's no kind of other other things yeah. going on, he, he well, wins, doesn't he? He come out and said he you know he's playing awful, and I just think you know what what must that do to other other snooker players when you know you, you're just seeing Ronnie Sullivan just get to another semi final, and he, he's turning around saying that he's you know he's he's playing awful. It's it must be just so demoralising thinking that you're. You know, doing your absolute best. And yeah, he's on, the, he's on the stinking week. The, the guy who's making it to all the finals, winning all of all the prizes, is is saying, "Look, I'm playing awful at the minute." So, yeah, obviously he's going into the semis as a um, strong favourite, and you'd expect him to to win the whole thing, wouldn't you, really? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm very aware, mate. There's loads to talk about on footy, but obviously there's a huge boxing weekend coming up as well, uh, and I know we're both mega excited for Callum to be putting on a show. Before we talk on Callum, I just want to touch on the AJ and Garnu fight, which yeah. has recently been announced. Um, I don't, from everything that I've seen on it, I personally, I'm not that, I'm not as angry, let's say, about it than I was when it was Fury and Garnu, and I think it's just because of Fury and put on his ass, basically. Do you know what I mean? It's it's give it that bit more jeopardy, I think. That you know yeah. this guy, guy who can punch, and I think so. What annoys just... me a little bit, that to be fair, not not you, not annoys me that you think that. Just annoys me the fact that Fiori was mocked for it, and now Joshua's being somehow lauded as oh yeah, he's yeah, well, he's, he's brave to take that on, and I, I get it because I, I guess having watched that fight and having most of the world watched that fight, you would think oh he's taking a risk here because now we can see what he can do. However. I think that if Fury was to watch someone else boxing, boxing Garni first, he's went in a bit more prepared. I'm not saying he took it easy, but you know we 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 threw it around whether it, whether he took it easy, whether it was just the fact that you know he was unorthodox or whatever. Whatever your opinion on is it, there's no doubt about it that having not seen in Garni box ever before was a mm. disadvantage to Fury. You can't look at it any other way than that. 
you know, after the interesting point, that's what you think then almost Fury should get the more respect because he was the first one to, you know, get in the ring with him. It, it's, you know what? Now that we've seen the fact that he's decent, yeah, I do. Do you know, if he was a bit awful, he'd have been like, oh my God, like this is, this is, this is horrific. But now that we've seen that he can be, and I look at time and, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? If Joshua knocks him up in the first round, you'd be saying, well, no, that, that is a bit embarrassing now, the whole Fury thing. But I listened to that. I don't know if you heard Darren Till's uh, little interview that he had with uh, Box and Social. And he was talking about, obviously, someone who's who's been in the octagon, somebody who's training now to be a boxer. And uh, mm. he used a nice little analogy, and it was like a, it was like a lovely little story. He was talking about, he said, me, me granddad used to be a wagon driver. Bear with me on this. And he said, when when we'd be uh, driving down the road, in the car, in his, in his car, he said he'd point up wagons and he'd go, um, I can't remember how we got to, he said something like, um, wagons just do what they want. And he was like, what do you mean, Grant? And he was basically, they're an immovable object. The wagons aside, they're coming across your lane, they're coming across whether you like it or not. So you've just got to stay out the way. And he said, that's the way that I see in Ghana. He's such a big brute force and he's such a unit that he, he moves and he does whatever he wants. And he said, and you could see the first time of Fury got him up against the ropes and he hit him and he realised he's not moving. He's not going anywhere. He said, so regardless of how, you know, unknown as he might be as a fight, as a boxer, how inexperienced he'd be, he's such an absolute wall that yeah. <laughs> you need to be incredibly tough to, to kind of, to knock him out or to, or to, to push him back. So, I think it's an interesting way of looking at it and, and we will see. Uh, we we'll definitely will see. But I, I believe, going back to your point, I, I think, it's it's a it's a bit ironic the Fury was getting mocked for almost making this fight and now Joshua has been applauded for, for taking it on. Yeah, I mean fight. you've already kind of made me, you know, kind of get back on my box a little bit because I didn't think of it like that. And I suppose you should you should really respect Fury for being the first one to jump in the ring with, you know, someone like Francis Ngaru. But I also think as well, you know, for Joshua, who else does he fight at the minute? Do you know what I mean? He's you know, he's waiting for this kind of Usyk and, and Fury thing to, to get set up. But hopefully, you know, he can maybe fight one of them again. Um, you know, Wild has, been, Wild has been beat. You know, he's, I think Joshua's already beat Parker, hasn't he, as well? It, it just feels a little bit like... It's money, isn't it? Let's be honest, it's money. Yeah. The, the fight was Zhang. Zhang was the fight. That was the fight that would have been interesting, would have been a, a really risky one for him. But I get it from a business point of view. Joshua was always admitted from day one, look, I'm a businessman. I want to try and make fights that are going to make the most money. And and to be fair, I, I respect any boxer or, or, or someone who's in the combat sport for doing that because they're putting the life on the line every time they go in the ring, particularly a heavyweight. Mm. So, yeah, I get it. I get why they've made the fight. Um, and I, I look, I'm not I'm not in either camp. I'm not I'm not uploading them for it. I'm not mocking them for it. I think it's a... I think it's the right calling. It's going to get attention. It'll get eyes. People will be interested. For me, from a from a boxing point of view, Jan was the fight. I thought that was the fight that would have been the most interesting to see and the most challenging. But I get how it was. A, it, that was a bit of a lose lose situation for Joshua. Well, yeah, yeah. He, he wins that fight, and it's like, oh, you beat another big big star legend. I mean, he's he beat Joe Joyce. So what? Yeah, he, I guess. I guess probably. Um, I guess the thing that. You know, he hasn't, like like we said last week, you know, Fiori's not really been saying much, but I guess the thing that I, I can imagine now that he will come out with and say, you know, why is no one slagging off Joshua? Because when I took yeah. this, everyone's yeah. out of pocket me. Now Joshua's taking it, no one's banning eyelids. And I think, you, you know, yeah, you make a great point. That's I think that's definitely one thing then Fiori can come back at us all with and say, well, do you know what I mean? It's, so yeah, it's Fiori's, Fiori's next move, as we said in the last podcast, is going to be fascinating, isn't it? You know, we, we don't oh, know yeah. whether this is this is the Tyson Fury that again is going to come out in a week's time and say I've retired now. Mm. I haven't even looked at boxing. I don't want to end no one boxing going to WWE or whatever it is. Or is the Fury who's locking himself away, doing some serious training, and he's going to come out and show the world, you know, what he's capable of? We really don't know, and and I think he likes it that way to keep people mm. guessing. One um, fighter who, um, one fighter who I think I've heard. Um, um, Joe Gallagher today talk about uh, who, you know, has been locked away training is uh, Tasha. I know she's not fighting until next weekend. So we'll talk about it more next week. But it was just interesting listening to uh, him on the radio today. He was saying, you know, he wished the fight was tomorrow. You know, she's looking that good. Mm -hmm. I think she's got a last spar on Saturday. And, you know, she's absolutely ready for the fight next week. And I just thought, you know, someone who, it, it just must be fascinating, must as a trainer, whether, 
you'd like to think, you know, Fiori's, you know, in tip top condition, ready to fight who's sick next month. Uh, you've got whoever it is you're training, that feeling of you've got a fighter, you're getting them, you're a week away, and you're just like, oh, you know what I mean? You've got them on the brink. A cage, of literally a caged animal, aren't they, for that last yeah. week? Yeah. Um, so either fighting this, but a great week for Tasha yet last week of training, and then she's fighting. And uh, hopefully, we'll be following on from Callum Smith's success, which hopefully he gets this weekend. Just, just before we go past Tasha's one, and, and just to kind of give it a big shout out to the Steve Clark, who's making his debut next week on Tasha's cards. He's he's um, coming out of the Rotunda, unbelievable amateur record. Another, again, another fighter coming out of the Rotunda, the production line. And he's being coached by Stephen Smith as well. Uh, I think, I guess, officially one of Stephen's first boxers that he be officially coaching so um i know there's a lot of scouts that'll be turning up for that i think is um he's got a few tickets left there as well so anyone who's looking to to get out and support the, the you know the liverpool fighters or again fights the fancies the bill it is a good one and um, best luck to see clark making his debut brilliant yeah and so we had scouts are there flying up minute in boxing so yeah calm's the big one this weekend um fighting uh better be of you you like this by the way i, I this was uh, reported by IFL TV not so long ago. I think it was a couple of hours ago. Uh, Better be ever records eight typical finding for raised levels of HGH and testosterone metabolite. Now, what they're saying um, is that oh. um, it was an atypical finding, but the fight will go ahead due to both substances occurring naturally in the body and follow-up tests that were recorded by VADA all came back negative. So, it's a bit of an iffy one, like, you know, <laughs> I guess you, you could say, or you could suggest that better be ever such a, um, such a masculine man that he's got huge levels of testosterone and not going to vote in his body. He's like the raging bull. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, you know what? Really, me, like, yeah, me being the pessimist as well, I, I think, you know, they've got that. I mean, it's like a, not to bring it back to like the, uh, to, to my kind of, Afghan war stories. I know I, I do come across like Uncle Albert off only feels and horses sometimes, but in Afghan, you know, the Taliban would watch us, we'd do something, and then they'd then watch us how we done it, and then they'd change their tactics, and then we'd change their tactics. Mm. And that's just how kind of war has went on, and I've seen it firsthand. With these drug cheats in sport, that's all that it is. You know, they do it, they do a certain, administer a certain drug, all these clever doctors. They, you know, they get yeah. caught and they go, right, okay, we know where we're going to get caught that way. Let's do it this way instead. And they're always one step ahead, aren't they, until... Mm. And I just think... I mean, listen, I'm, I'm completely going off on one ear in the sense that it might be genuinely natural, oh, yeah, like you say. Know. But, like, it, that to me just says that the doctors are finding better ways to mask these things and better ways to hide it and better ways to... Because... Possibly, yeah. I don't know. It just, it just stinks, doesn't it? There's just that much... Yeah, especially, you know what, it, it, look, it, as you say, it might be nothing. And I'm sure it is nothing. It might have just been a bit of clickbait, but, it, you know, it, yeah. why? Just, you, you don't want to hear it, do you? You just don't, you no, don't, don't want to hear it. it. You don't want to hear about it, no, particularly in the, in the fight of this magnitude. And again, particularly when we're so close to it, is in being for Liverpool, seeing the work, the Callum's got, see how much it means to him, seeing how frustrating it's been for him, waiting for this big fight and, you know, how inactive he's, he's been at times because people have avoided him. This mm. is the biggest fight of his career by a distance now. Um, biggest fight he'll probably ever have. And you've got that kind of lingering stuff. You just don't you don't want it to, yeah. You don't want that to be any in the news at all. No, and I think um I mean what a tough task he's got going up. Against better be have nineteen fights. I think it's nineteen knockouts, I think it is, isn't it? Um Yeah. And and Callum's four to one to win the fight, which I think is a massive price. Again, mm. it's not about better be have, you know, how great he is, but Listen, I think I've said it before. Callum is my favourite fighter, and I just, I just, obviously because he's because he's never been. I think even when he got beat by Canelo, he was, um, he, he was kind of he wasn't knocked out or nothing, was he, Callum? And I just can't envisage just seeing a Callum Smith, you know, lying knocked out on the on the ring. I just can't see it. Um, and I think he will. I think he'll win. Obviously, better be Ebbs going in there, odds on favourite. But I don't know. I've just got a feeling that Callum's going to upset the odds and, and do a job on him. I really do. And Maybe that's me thinking too much with my heart, not thinking properly about it with my head. But yeah, I just I think he'll do it. Um, yeah, look, well, I, I really hope he does do it, and I think he, you know, he don't use the words, you know, box fighters, fighters chance for nothing. You know, he's got a fighters chance. He's going in, 
he's not he's not just going in, you know, hoping to win. He's going in believing he's going to win, and he's got on merit. He's there, you know. He's, he's, it's the it's the right it's the right fight for him. Um, I think it's a big test for for Better Bev. And, mm. and I think you know if you if you look at Better Bev's records as as impressive it is, he's not really been tested. He's not he's not forced anyone who's coming at him on the front foot. Now the argument might be. He has his four fighters who can fight on the front foot, but they've not been allowed to. But he's, you know, he's a he's a bully, and you know, he's a bully, you know, on merit as well. Like he's capable oh. of bullying people, and he's he's powerful and and all that. But it'll be interesting to hopefully see him not have his own weight the whole fight. Um, it was really yeah, interesting. Canelo, to see Canelo, it, Canelo's an interesting kind of um, comparison, though, because. Canelo was accused a little bit of being a bully going into that fight with Callum and, and we thought it was going to be the same. Mm. Although Canelo didn't knock him out, he you know, he ruptured Callum's bicep, just mm. pure smashing him in and out. And and you know, I, I'm sure that's fully recovered now and I don't want to suggest that there's there's an injury there because that's I don't think that's the case at all. But the better we have Campbell will probably be tempted as well to to, to follow sure, him sure that tactics, going yeah. at that arm because because of the way that's obviously Callum's stance and the way he protects himself, it would be interesting to see if they do try to work in a, in a similar manner and work and that, on that, that front arm there. Yeah, that catch counter as well, what Callum does so well. You know, it's he's got a whole highlight reel of those that catch counter that he does. Um, the left hook. Yeah, the left hook. I think what was interesting as well, I've seen better be able to fought Usyk as well in his amateur days, I think. It mm. was. And, uh, you know, he's not ruled out going up a weight as well. Um but no, mate, that's... I mean, Maybe you're right. Look, look, Callum, Callum's got a chance. You know, I, I don't know whether they, I'd love him to win. Obviously, more than anything else, I believe he can win. I don't think it'll be as huge a shock as 4-1 to one suggests, and the odds are quite wide, you're right. Um, mm. but yeah, you know what? You'll know within two rounds. I think that's what, that's what I'd say. You'll know within two rounds. If Callum's getting close to him, he's pushing him back on occasion. Mm. I've got no doubt that he can win, and I've got no doubt in that case that he can stop him. Either fighter... Is capable of stopping you there. I know what you're saying about I can't imagine Callum being on his back, but if anyone is going to do it, it would be better to be out. Yeah, it's only good I'm not seeing. Do remember the weight? He's now he's now light heavyweight. He's he's up a division compared to where he's been most of his career. Mm. So, yeah, look, it's got all the makings of a classic as well. Two fighters who were who were who were certainly not going to, you know, back off or or try and be protected. They're going to go and fight in the front foot, and it's you know it should be a great fight and all the best for Callum. Of course. Yeah. All the best for Callum that is on early hours for us Sunday morning. Um, right, mate, let's let's try and be as well. Let's for, probably for me, I'm normally the one who puts my foot in diplomatic. it. Uh, yeah, let's try and be as diplomatic and as as PC as we can as we as we dive into what's been a crazy world of football. We've got some mad transfers going on. We've got some loans. We've got some financial fair play. We've got the Gambia team having to do an emergency flight because the. Have you not heard this one? That was probably yeah. We'll mm-hmm. start with that one. So the Gambia, um, the Gambia team obviously heading off to the African Cup of Nations. The plane had to be um, had to do an emergency landing after twenty minutes because the air conditioning wasn't working properly, and the airplane was like heating up and people were like fainting on the flight and things like that. And Jesus it, Christ, you know it was. Um, I don't know why I'm kind of laughing about it. It was apparently quite a scary ordeal with the Gambia. You know- uh, managers you know saying what? that you know, you know the people could have died on it and things like that overheating and stuff like that the air conditioner was anyway so yeah the state so scary say, African nations. there's always just mad stuff that goes on isn't there in the african nations and, and again I, I know you're not knocking it it was obviously a serious situation at the time there always seems to be something crazy that happens isn't it like whether it's a you know, a coach has been held up or something. The, the players coaching oh. and, and last year wasn't it? Was that the last? Not last year. The last African Nations. One of the coaches yeah. got like, held up, didn't it? And they, they got held hostage and stuff. At, at gunpoint, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. It, it's just. I mean, look. It, some of the some of the nations, obviously, that are competing in the African Nations, are, are still war torn, so to speak, and and the divides. Yeah. You know, and got all kinds of internal struggles. So, you know, we're not we're not saying that that's that's amusing or nothing, but it's such a oh, boy, it's yes. competition, and it always throws up mad stories that you don't normally hear about in relation to football. I think you're gonna struggle to get a crazier story though than than yeah, the Gambia airplane overheating and having to do an emergency landing after 20 minutes. I think that's that's probably topped it already. To be fair, before the ball's even yeah. kicked. Um. 
Also made some sad news as well about Sven Goran Eriksson. It's come out this week um, that he's got terminal cancer. Terminal, yeah. Doc- doctors have gave him a year to live. It made me actually think back to um, you know, Sven was like the first foreign manager, wasn't he, for England? And I, I think he got a bit of a, I think he got a bit of a, a tough rap because, because 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 he was the first one. It was that, yeah. But he, he was also like he come with a bit of a reputation of being. You know, a, la- um, a ladies man. Yeah, exactly. It's the the Ulrika Johnson stuff that went on, and I think it was like he was so different to the, and he was like nicknamed the professor, wasn't he? Mm. He's so different to the traditional manager he has, and and you know, it was at a time when there was a lot of pressure on that that generation, with the golden generation, wasn't it? And yeah, the country and was so successful. I think everyone wanted it to be an English manager, the the, the kind of yeah. approach. Well, yeah, you've seen. You listen to the people. Sorry, do you listen to the players who come out and spoke about him and nobody pro professional point of view has got anything mm-hmm. but pure praise for for how good he was. And I think he was unlucky in the sense that one, he was the first foreign manager. Uh, and two, yeah, we did have our golden generation, but when we got beat by Brazil, you know, Brazil had their golden generation as well. I think Brazil had three Ballon d'Or winners in the in the you know in the in the attack. So it wasn't as if like we had our golden generation playing against complete mugs. You know, we were playing our golden mm. generation against Brazil's golden generation. And, you know, we were unlucky on, I think, a couple of times going out on pens. It might have been one time. Um, that kind of freak Ronaldinho goal. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, he was unlucky at the England job. And just incredibly sad news, I guess, isn't it? Um, to think that, I mean, I can't even imagine what getting a diagnosis like that would be like, how you, you know, what mindset you're in. And, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and that goes without saying, I think. Um, the only thing I'd, I'd temper that with, what a life he's had. Wow. Do you know what I mean? He's 76. Oh, God, yeah. He's 76. Look, there's... there's is, is he 76? I'm not saying, 76, yeah. It's, no, wow. it's not, I I'm not I saying that there's... Old. No, he's 76. So, like, you know, let, let's let's put a bit of context to it. There's, there's people who were in the 30s, 40s who are yeah, getting these diagnoses. Yeah, yeah. He's had one of the best lives you can imagine being yeah. top in football for so long, but also, as we touched on, top having a pretty well. decent, pretty decent, <laughs> decent social life. So yeah, look, sad news definitely, and and I, I think say, that's what yeah. that's what actually got on the sack, wasn't it? Wasn't he shagging his um his PA or something? Wasn't it? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. A, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But no, joking aside, yeah, devastating news for him. Um, so sh- should we dive in at some way and talk about the the elephants in the room, which is Joey Barton? He's been making headlines this week, whether it's him just getting stuff off his chest or whether he's trying to promote his new podcast or whether he's just bored on holiday. Whatever the reason, he has been making... Uh, the government have been talking about it, believe it or not, as well as everyone on Twitter, on radio stations up and down the country, and yeah, been making quite the noise. Do and you, I'm do you know what bit... I'll say? Do you know... Go on, go on, let you go first. Yeah, so my take on it then is I'm actually a little bit pissed off at him. Um Obviously, you can be pissed off at a lot of the stuff he said if if, if you're that way inclined and you, and you want to be offended by it. I, I just take it with a pinch of salt, you know what I mean? If you look on Twitter, it's it's just vile most of the time anyway. It's you know anyway, yeah. It's cesspit anyway, so why are you expecting to find anything mm-hmm. different? So some of the stuff he's been saying, you know, I've not really took any notice that. What's angered me, and it's angered a few people I've spoken to this week, is he actually had a valid point? He actually had a, a, like a, a decent argument to at least open up a debate. And mm. what he's done by just going off and shooting from the hip as he's done is he's just created this really toxic... It's a siege mentality now as well. Like the, the broadcasters have kind of went, well, Sam, we're, we're going to go the opposite way now because we don't yeah. want to be seen to listen he's, to people like you. He's created the toxic conversation. And now, any time, I guarantee, any time someone has got a problem, with a female commentator or a female analyst or a female co-commentator or a female presenter, anything like that, if you're unhappy with it and you voice your concern, they're going to be seen to be Joey Barton. You're going to be labelled as the next, you know, Joey Barton's camp, and which is not the case because you know, mm. I, I have moaned, I've had a you know a, a moan on Twitter that you know Michael Owen's analysis is crap. Do you know uh, what I mean? And, man, I mean. <laughs> you know, yeah. Co- so it's not like. I, I think he's just yet yeah, polluted the whole debate now because any time now you look on Twitter and you say, you know, someone's a female is a bad presenter, it's 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 just it won't be a it won't be a decent debate that can be had anymore because he's ruined it. And that that's been the big thing for me. And 
he started going against the, the poor girl. Um, uh, we, we mentioned the name before we started. I can never. A loco. A loco. Uh, a loco. Um, I'm not being funny. She is awful. She is really bad at her job. Whether she was just having a bad day or not, she she seems crap every time I've seen her. Um, I know she's done a few gaffes, like we all do. Like you know, she once said, you know, players scored 25 goals in 50 games or something. That's like oh, that's a goal a game, something like that. She said, which is obviously a bit, a bit yeah, silly. Yeah. But... It's obviously wrong mathematically. Well, as well, yeah. And, and like I say, in in general, you know, people do get things wrong, and I just listen. I don't care if you're a man or if you're a woman. I don't care if you've played the game and won the Ballon d'Or, or you just happen to be an unbelievable analysis that you can break. You can break a first half of football down for me in fifteen minutes at half time and tell me what they're doing well, what they're not doing. Like, I don't care what experience you've had. I just want you to be good at it. Now, yeah. whether that you're a man or a woman, I don't care. And I think that that's what it should be about. It should be about people getting jobs on merit. And the argument that he was saying is obviously now there are certain women who are getting jobs just because the women, which is wrong. And yeah, so that's my say. I'm pissed off. I, th- I think the last thing you've said is spot on. The last thing you've just said is spot on. Getting the job on merit mm. and getting the job based on your ability to do that job. And um, I can only compare it to you know the way. I can only compare it or I, to to this extent to like you know the the misrepresentation, a lack of representation, for example, of you know black blacks and and Asians and and whatever in in management and coaching jobs. Mm. That that's it's not right when you think about the the demographic of this country and and the percentage of blacks and Asians that we've got. That maybe there isn't as many in those posts. But sometimes there's, it's, they're just not the right person for the job. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter whether you're black, white, you know, Asian, female, male, disabled, whatever it is. Yeah. It should be about the best person for the job. So and um, going back to your point before, whether you've won the balance or, or or whatever, that we've seen over years, that doesn't make you a good coach or a good manager. Oh, you know, classic yeah. John Barnes, one of the best players to ever play the game. Awful manager, awful coach. It's yeah. you know it's been seen. And and he's, he's he's in both of those categories, you know, ex unbelievable player, and also black. But mm. it doesn't mean to say that he should get a job because he's black or because he's played football. And, and, it's and there are two well. things that have happened over the over yeah. the years for no reason. And you know, it, it even going back to the eighties or maybe early nineties, no one was even allowed to be a talk about football unless you played it. And we know that that's not true anymore. Some of the best, you mm. know, Adrian Zuberman talks. I know he gets, you know. Slides off to sometimes debate and, and the stuff he says, but incredible broadcaster, brilliant at his job. You know, it, yeah. you don't have to be an ex footballer to also be a good, you know, pundit or broadcaster. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right. I, I think you're spot on what you said there, to be fair, and, and I'm not likely to agree with you on, on that stance. But I agree that Joey Barton is, is, is now meant that people who have got an issue with certain people on telly are then going to be put in his camp just because of the way that he's portrayed that that opinion or that that's and that. this, this this argument of you know women um who, who are now commentating or giving their thoughts and views um of somehow are there on merit because they played for England a hundred times like you've just said about John Barnes that means fuck all I don't care if you're mm. a woman and you've won the World Cup for fucking England's women's team that you should you still could be awful at analysis or awful at commentary. Do you know what mm. I mean? It's like that this whole thing of she's played a hundred times for England that great, but she might not be able to articulate points well at half time, which would make her shit out of job. Great footballer. Yeah. Shit out of let's, job. Be, let's be honest as well. Like if you're in that position, and this is where I guess it's different. If you if you were if she was in the changing room and she she tried to talk and she said some of the things she said on telly, she wouldn't be in a job. Because the players would just be like, "You need to do yeah. one, you because you, you, you're talking crap." So it's a little, I it's a little bit like it. Let's not make this a personal attack on air, by the way. Because no, no, because there's there's a, there's a yeah, there's, there's a few women and there's a few men who I could probably name who, who, who I don't like, and it's just it's it's the same argument of you know Stephen Gerrard, unbelievable footballer, probably one of the greatest yeah, ever, yeah. awful manager. Do you know what I mean? It's like. Any of these, a woman, a woman football, I've just said, could be amazing. Doesn't make it a great commentator. And I think this, just this filling quotas and filling 
position. I can the other thing. Can the other thing, right? And and this is this is maybe a a, a criticism of the broadcasters. I think that's probably what you're getting at. They put it in that position, what? so you know. It might be that she could actually be a decent presenter. She's been made a pundit. So, yeah. you know, you don't have to be in that. You know what I mean? There's a million different roles mm-hmm. you can play in that particular. You know, you could be pitch side. You could be in the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not telling me that there's not better women. And I'm, let's not talk about women here, by the way. You're not telling me there's not better women out there. Like, you know, Laura Woods didn't play football. Unbelievable yeah. broadcaster and presenter. Yeah. All day, people like her, who were very, very good. Uh, and mm-hmm. who've got the knowledge, but also can articulate themselves well. They do the research, you know. Yeah. They, they think before they speak. Uh-huh. I'm, I've got no problem whatsoever with you know males, females, or anyone being in that position as long as they can actually present yeah. what's in front I'm, of them. I'm like you say, there's so many different roles. They could be pitch side speaking to the players, doing interviews like that because they're a player themselves. They might have a better bond with them that way. But yeah. Anyway, Joey Barn, I think, has fucked it for this type of debate. Thankfully, me and you are mates, and we can have a debate. But I think if you're trying to have this on Twitter, it had just descended into chaos very quickly, unfortunately now, because of that's the landscape which Joey Barton has created, I think. And, and look, let, let's let's be clear as well. We both got daughters. We both want our daughters to have the highest possible aspirations. I want my daughter to be watching the telly, and she says I want to do that job. I want her to think she can get that job. And I don't yeah. want people standing in their way who are not good enough, yeah. you know, and just there because they played for England or, or whatever. And that's, a, I think... I think that's a really good point you make there, and I think that's spot on. And I'm, again, regardless of whether they're male, female, or otherwise, yeah. they should be there based on the fact that because of the job, not because yeah. they've done something in a previous life. You imagine if one of our daughters are just absolutely football mad, you know what I mean? Playing football manager could say it every footballer under the sun of, you know, who's playing for who, who's playing for who. And then you've got, you know, somebody who happens to be good at football on a presenting job just because, you know what I mean? They played it. it and you've, and you've it's quite like that. Way it. It. Uh, so like Ray of Light has a funny one. I know you won't mind this, even though some people might think it's I'm being a bit harsh. Cause you got blew up. I'm not yeah. sure that means you can just be a stunt man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, that was thrilling, isn't it? Yeah. I've got one leg, yeah. No, one else, can do that. no one else can do that. Yeah. I have I've got to do it because I've got experience in this. I don't mind getting blown up again in that car. It's, it's just, honestly, yeah, it's fucking bullshit. But, mm. um, so there was that one to get to. I thought we handled that quite well, by the way. I was, I was yeah. dreading that. Oh, hopefully on a front. Yeah. We'll see. Before we, get, before we get abused. <laughs> um, I thought, which was an interesting debate as well, um, actually a couple of like, quite, a, quite what could be deep debates or long debates, really, we try and get through. I saw this week on um, Stick to Football, there was this big debate on managers and who gets the kind of last say. Is it the kind of the owners? Is it the director of football? Is it the manager who gets the last say? And, and Jamie Carragher made a, a point that when Liverpool got Mohamed Salah, it wasn't Klopp that wanted them. It was basically the transfer committee had said, look, you know, you're having him. And I just thought it'd be interesting on talking about signings and also we're going to talk a little bit about coaches, you know, who should have the final say and who's kind of, you know, basically a similar debate, but they had. I thought they handled it really well. If anyone's not seen it, it's definitely worth a watch. It's, but, good. It's, it's, it's worth a watch every week, generally. Yeah. It's, very- yeah, it's brilliant, yeah. And I just think it, it, it is a really interesting one, would it be in the transfer market now? Uh, would it be an open, sorry, the transfer window? You know, how good a manager needs to be at pretty much every aspect of his job, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's such a difficult job and it's so hard to even answer of, you know, who has the final say, because you used that example of Mo Salah. You know, you can't even imagine a, a world where Klopp's saying, I don't want him. I don't know whether he said, I don't want him, or maybe he might not have been his first pick, whatever he'd said, but you can't even imagine Klopp saying that now, can you? Do you know what I mean? He's absolutely the first name on the team sheet. And I just no, think it's really interesting. Yeah, definitely. And you you speak about, like, listening and watching podcasts like that, they're really interesting. And anyone who hasn't watched... Money ball. I mean, you hear that you hear that you hear it thrown about when you talk about any team that's investing in, you know, statistical related um, yeah. talent. But watch Money Ball if if you, if you kind of want an interesting insight into how maybe different roles within a club. And that's you know, actually Liverpool's yeah. owners as well, Fenway, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the ones who ends up employing it. I was meeting at the end at the Red Sox is when they're trying to employ him, aren't they? And then they end yeah. up using the same methods. So it, it wasn't the owners. In the original case, but they're the ones who ends up adopting the same system. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, th- I think that's a good way of, and we, we use that in, in college when we're trying to teach the students about, like, you know, one's talent ID, but also the fact that it's not always the coach, the manager, the be all and end all, and that's the final say, and knows everything. You know, sometimes you're looking at it. Everyone, and I, I always try and compare, it's like a business. When you're in a particular role, you look at, you know, everything through your eyes, don't you? And what, you know, your... And it's all everything you look at is based on your own experience and on what you're looking to get out of a particular situation. And everyone's got preferences. Um so I think I think going back to your question, I'm not a I'm not a believer given that the amount of technology and the amount of um resource that we've got at our disposal now that there's any need for the manager to almost be oh. have that as a responsibility, you know. I, I I think the way it should be, I, I think it, the way it's always been deep down, you read, like, you go back to, like, your Brian Clough days and all that, he go to his mate who was a scout, and I, I'm looking for a forward, you can hold the ball up, you can do this, and Jimmy glad with, oh, Nottingham accent or Yorkshire yeah, accent, yeah. you can hold the ball up and, and whatever. It, it's still the same now. Salah, I mean, Clough probably didn't want Salah, but mm. he, if his scouts and his analysis team come to him and said, look, the recruitment team, this is what Salah's capable of. I'm pretty sure Clark wouldn't have been Of course, yeah. But it's probably just the, the, the vision of salary ads in his head was the one at Chelsea, maybe the one at Roma. Mm. You know, you're not the type of person he envisaged, you know, fitting into his style of play. Well, on that note then, what I did want to talk to you about is, is actually, you know, a decent coach because, you you know, if you turn around and say Clark wants to turn down Salah, then you'd think he wasn't a very good coach. He's obviously went on them and performed absolute miracles. And I just wanted to ask you, because I know we're going to mention a little bit at the end about NFL. There's been a pretty big um, legendary uh, coach leaving there. But in football, with regards to coaching, you know, who would you have as your top three in order as your best three managers? Because let's face it, you know, they are the ones whether you know, they're, like we've just joked, making the signings or not. They're the ones who heads are on the block. They're the ones who get the, you know, get the accolades when they win trophies we- and they're the ones. They're the ones who are getting sacked if, if things aren't going right. So, you know, the manager's such an important role. Just right, so what are we talking about? Not to be, like, picky, yeah. But what are we talking about? Are we talking about a coach, somebody who's on the grass every day working with the players? Are we talking about the old-school manager? I think Klopp would consider himself a manager. He's got well, an idea. Whether you... Yeah, so the question is, then, whether you... Brendan Rodgers, I think, is more of a coach, for example, is what I'm getting at. Okay, so... Whether you want to define it as a coach or a manager, I want to know in football, whether it's in England or across Europe, who is the greatest manager. So whether you want to define that as a manager or a coach, whether you define it on success, who would you say is the top three? And I know obviously there's different ways to manage, like you say, whether it's coaching or whether it's management. If you're going to generalise it and say, who is your top three in order, who would you be going for? Um, well, I'm going to say and go for like pioneers. People who come up with a you know a different way of doing things, whether it was through the the way that they manage people, you know the 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 systems that they, that they put into play. Um, number three, I'm going to go with Rigo Saki, just because he was the first one to employ a proper defensive line, a deep defensive line. It's like the the, the creator of the way that the Italians mark. He 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 come up with that system. It all looked defined. Serie A back, you know when AC Milan were conceding five goals in a season. Events is the same and and, and whatever. Um, I, I'm going to go with him as number three. You know, incredibly successful, but the influence he had not only on his own teams but on other managers after him. Um, I mean, that was back in the days when you know Italian football was unbelievable, and he was just known as, you know, no one scores past Italian teams. It was brilliant, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, next, I'm going to go um, for the same reason. I, I'm not, I'm not going to finish with a final one. The same reason I'm going to go Johan Cruyff again. Came up with the whole Barcelona Ajax philosophy of playing tiki taka. If you like, how many teams have replicated that since? But also, you know, a person who showed there's a bit of feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Screw back a bit. Sorry. That's it. When, when they, that's it. Also, another person who's shown that he can translate being a, a world class, one of the best players in the world, into being one of the best coaches in the world. He decided when he was going to become a coach. I'm going to do things different. I want to make sure that my team's playing a particular way. He was so precise with his instructions. He almost created a rule book of this mm-hmm. whole system, which so many people have copied. Um, and again, I, I, you know, you, you, 
you think of the players who plays under like Guardiola, you know, took that on, um, and and obviously moved that on. It's it's gone through generations, and it, and there's been very few tweaks to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's impact on football. I mean, it second to none, really, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would I would say so. Um, number one, no, and and I know you I know you're not gonna like this. Um, I can't not pick Alex Ferguson. He's my really number one. Yeah, I can't not pick. Well, yeah, fair enough. I can't not pick Alex Ferguson. Just, just from sheer dragging a football club from its knees all the way up to the very best club in the world, best team in the world, club, club in the world. He's done that almost single handedly, didn't he? You know, not all like I'm not saying United were nothing, but they were literally on the knees. They were close to relegation. He come in from Aberdeen, having already took them to the European Trophy, a club that had no right to even be competing as the best team in Scotland, let alone one of the best clubs in Europe. And then to come in and, and, and to a United, to a club that was in complete disarray, to a team that was overage, you know, full of has-beens, you know, mm. and almost sign and by sign and player by player to ride that club to, from where it was to be in the best club in the world. Mm. I say club deliberately because they became a financial superpower. They became almost the first football franchise, so soccer franchise that we ever seen. Yeah. Um, not in short, a remarkable. And 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 I think, you know, you listen to the um, it's called again that we've just been talking about the podcast. It's oh, really keen out this week. Stick yeah, sticks to football. in football, yeah. Yeah, you know, look, he has an indifference effect on some players. Like some players didn't like him. Rui Keane, you get mm-hmm. the impression, didn't really like Ferguson. You know, he respected him for what he done, but didn't really like him. Yet, he got mm-hmm. absolutely every ounce yeah. of, of ability out of him, didn't he? Well, I think, um, so I'll, I'll just go, yeah, in, in my order. I'll just go, yeah, my number one was Alex Ferguson as well. Um, I was lucky enough, I got to meet him once at Ainsley Races, and not many people you kind of meet and you just like straight away in order someone. You know. you know, I was almost just nervous to look at him and then look at me. And, you know, really, really special guy. I think, you know, if you believe the report, he was one game away from getting the sack. You know, United were in such a bad way. You know, you reckon one more yeah. defeat, he was gone. I think someone ended up scoring a win in the last minute. He, he picks up a draw or three points and keeps him for the next week. And then, as you say, the rest is history. I think you mentioned then, you know, he's not always thought of by some players that likes a key and maybe yaps down. But, he knew when to get rid of players. He, he wasn't scared of, you know, strengthening making, them decision. By making those difficult decisions. And, you know, just a serial winner, wasn't he? Absolutely unbelievable, I think. So, yeah, I'll go in reverse order than what you did. Number one would be uh, Alex Ferguson. Number two for me, I am going to say it, I think it's Jürgen Klopp because I think you talk about the job that Ferguson's done with, you know, Man United. Okay, Liverpool win is down and out, as maybe United was in the kind of eighties when Ferguson joined. But let's face it, Liverpool hadn't won the league in thirty years. You know, he had such a mammoth task of coming in and changing the whole make of the club, as he, as he said, you know, turning doubters into believers. In eight years, you know, he's, he's won the league. He's went toe to toe with with arguably the greatest team ever assembled and took them down to the last day of the season twice. I think to do that, I think when we look back at the greatest teams in the Prem, I think this Man City team will be it. And I think the fact that Klopp took them to, you know, the last game of the season twice and managed to win one in between, I think that'll go down as as such a big achievement, albeit he's only won one Premier League. The Champions League, you know, one final, two two finals where we were beaten. But again, just to get to the final is such a big deal, you know. And the way he's done it, I think, is the most amazing thing about him. He's done it in a time where they haven't had the resources of the Man City to go and just buy, you know, £100 million players. He's had to chop and change. He's selling players to bring players in. I think he's he's done it so well and in the right way, if you like, in the romantic way of, you know, not just buying your way. He's really had to work at it. I think his man management skills were great. And for me, I do yeah, maybe I have got me Liverpool, you know, hat on when I say that. But for me, I just think... You know, what he'd done in Germany, Bruce Dortmund going up against Bayern Munich and stuff. He's done really well with them. Coming to Liverpool and basically replicating it. I think he definitely, for me, he's number two, but I think in most people, he's definitely probably top five. I think, you know, really an unbelievable manager. And number three, I'm going to go for Jose Mourinho. I think, you know, you talk about a winner. I know sometimes the style of football isn't always the greatest, but if you want someone that's going to win, you go with him. 
you know, the first manager to win, I think it's the four European Cups, is it? Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, only because the, the Conference League was so, yeah, so. Basically, the, I won it. yeah. Well, I just think, you know, him, and the reason that it was, it was between him and Guardiola, to be honest, but I went for Mourinho because I, I do think there is a bit of Guardiola where, you know, he hasn't won the Champions League without, well, he has now, sorry, but um, he didn't win it without Messi for so long. And he had, he had the, I think when you've got Messi in your team, I just think it, it does make things a little bit easier. I know he's still built a whole team and he's like, we've mentioned, he's took over the, the Johan Cruyff way. And he's a great manager, obviously, but I think for someone who, you know, started off with Porto, you know, wins the Champions League, you know, knocks Man United out, you know, at Old Trafford, goes on, wins the Champions League, comes to the Prem, you know, I think is at one point, one of his home teams hadn't been beaten for something like four years, something like that. Well, probably the start of it, Porto, and then it, and then it went Chelsea. Two games, and two, two jobs on the bounce, wasn't it? I think it might have been three, you know, it might have been three. Yeah. It was some crazy record of just, you know, if you come to my place, you're not getting anything from it. Um, mm. And I just think, yeah, just, and I, and I liked his arrogance, his cockiness. He had a bit of swagger about him. I thought he got the best, best out of players, whether he had, you know, a poorer team like the likes of Porto or even um, when he managed in Roma. Roma now, we've maybe not have had, always had the best players, but he managed them such, so well in the team, whether that's defensively or not. He was, he was just a serial winner, which I think you've just got to respect. And um, I just think, yeah, an unbelievable manager. I would have loved to have seen him come to Liverpool. Before he went to Chelsea, um, before he before he got really stale as well. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, you can look at it. Maybe he's stale now, but I mean, he's had a good what twenty years. Oh yeah, he's, oh he's yeah, yeah, he has a good. And, and you know what? What you've also got to respect, uh, you know, you majority of Klopp's and stuff, and 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 um, and Guardiola, certainly more Guardiola than Klopp. They were picking up kind of a, a somebody else's book, as you said, through Johan Cruyff and. A lot of Italian managers, including Ancelotti, had picked up Arrigo Safi's, you know, book and went, okay, well, I was why I was why adapt that. Mourinho just was just you used the word like serial winner about Alex Eggs and before. That's what he was as well. He, he was just like, well, I'm gonna find a way to win. There was no real preference for Mourinho how he plays. He was like, I'll play whatever. He, he was one of the first like first managers, and that's what I love about Ferguson. One of the first managers in Ferguson who would like be throwing four forwards up. He throws yeah, yeah. centre half up front. Do you know what I mean? And clocked on that. I remember once at uh, uh, once twice at Anfield. It, it yeah. didn't matter to him. There was not. There was no such thing. Obviously, there was a way of starting the game, but he would do absolutely anything to win that game, including getting himself sent off, including mm-hmm. turning the, the you know almost bringing the game into disrepute at times just to take you know spin the the game back in his direction. And I think even you know, if going to have a little bit of a playful pop at Man United. Even like a club at Man United, the disarray there at the minute, he still manages to win the League Cup, the Community Shield in, Europa, in the Europa League. You know, that's a Man United yeah. team that has gone through all that shit after Fergie. And he's, yeah. you know... Yeah, so that's my top three. Fergie, Klopp and Mourinho. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, I can't... Like, if it, was, if it was my generation, by the way, because a big criticism, well, you didn't, you know, you weren't watching Rigo Saki, or you weren't watching Johan Cruyff. I'd probably have Bobby Robson in the mix somewhere, to be honest. And... Um, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of like people people do you know what I mean and and somebody mm. clearly a, a proper man manager and a mm. personality and someone who kind of almost like a bit like face and takes on the club and takes on the nation when they get a job and mm. you know it's for someone who, who didn't you know it wasn't as nice as tongue at Barcelona but he became a proper fan's favorite in the club loved oh, him and yeah. adored him wherever he went he was adored. Yeah. And I think to be able to be that likable, but also to be successful and, and a leader, I think is is so admirable. And um, he's a bit in there for me as well, probably. Uh, probably a you know a, a bit of a nod for Arsene Wenger as well. He completely changed. Yeah, the yeah. Arsene changed the Premier League altogether. Yeah. He he made the Premier League what it is now in terms of you know really leading the the way and the influx of foreigners and change of culture and, wasn't and, it really. Yeah, sports science and and nutrition yeah. and everything. He, he completely flipped it. So. Yeah, loads of big, brilliant coaches. And as you said, at the start of the piece, Andy, this little conversation come from about because Bill Belichick has, has, has stepped down, you were calling. I think it's it's a, a bit of a mutual consent decision. The, the Pats have had one of their, uh, New England Patriots, I should say, have had one of their worst seasons in, in a long while. I think they lost 13, won four, and the owners decided to, to park company with Bill Belichick. But I think it's 21 seasons in, in the NFL, six Super Bowls, which is 
it will never be topped by anyone. I don't care what you're saying. It's never going to happen. In this age where, you know, owners, whether it's in NFL, basketball, soccer, as they would call it, are so trigger happy. Nobody's sticking by a coach for 21 years and nobody, therefore, is going to win seven, sorry, six Super Bowls. Yeah, it's always sad, isn't it? When they, yeah, it's always sad when the likes of Ferguson, the likes of him have to step down and it's... Yeah, it's 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 just and it will be an end of an era for for anyone who's associated that to that team, won't it? Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 he had to reinvent that. And that was always great about Ferguson. I don't know we've spoken about this a few times. You know, off it, how many times he had to reinvent that team? Bill Belichick had to do the same. He'd lose his quarterback, and then he'd lose him again the next. He'd lose his running back. Yeah. In NFL in particular, there's so much turnover year in year out. You've got the draft and all the drama that goes with that. So, so like you need to be the most resilient and adaptable coach ever because you're yeah. constantly turning over your players. Yeah. But um, and and injuries happen so frequently in the NFL. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's six times even that. Um, yeah. So made on that, there are a few other little football and bits which we'll we'll kind of go over quickly. You've got a uh, Jaden Sancho's Man United nightmare has ended for the time being, at least anyway. It's yeah, for the time being, yeah. Only six month deal, but you can already tell like the sniping that's going on. He's put a message out to the Brucey Dortmund fans saying, I'm home. And you know, it's Man United that's done a very kind of just a short and sweet. He's gone on loan. Definitely no love lost there. And it's just going to be really interesting to see what happens at the end of the season, whether he's whether his form picks up for Dortmund. At the end I was going to say that's the interesting bit in how he plays and the impact he can have on the team. Is he, is he going to, you know, pick up enough form to get into Southgate's plans for the Euros? Is he going to, Pick up enough form where Dortmund say, "Look, we'll have you back." Well, United want to get some of them. I mean, it's price that he went. Like, you forget how much he went for. It was a lot of money he went to United for. Um, it's just been a horrendous transfer, hasn't it? One well, that's really, really backfired. And um, yeah, it's over for him at least at the, for the for the next six months. Anyway, you can at least be happy back home in Germany. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think sometimes, look, like like anyone in life, if you're not happy. It doesn't matter what your ability is and, and, and all the things around, you know, tactics and managers and all that. If you're not happy in, in a certain environment, you, you just can't perform, can you? You're not going to be willing or capable of performing. So, you know, from from an English perspective, you're going to say, well, he, he's an English, he's a young English player, still still a huge talent there. Mm. And I'd just like to see that talent fulfilled. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's always sad to see when, when, that, when that, that happens. But, um, yeah, I mean... I, as much as it's a blotch on United's recruitment and the way they've handled the player and the talent, it's also a bit of a blotch on Sancho's CV. You can't, you know, you can't look at it and go, okay, United are the villains here because they've turned over coaches or haven't fit them into a system or ten args, you know, yeah. you know, made them out to be the villain. He's not performed at the end of the day. You know, he's gone from. And the other thing as well, which um, I was really interested to hear as well, it's not his first time he's been having spots like this. I think he'd done something similar as well. Early on in his career, and also in, I heard on on the radio before that he was playing in a in an under eighteens or something uh, game, and the team were getting beat, and he basically just gave up on his team. I think it was uh, Kieran Dyer on Talksport talking about it, and he said like you know he couldn't believe a player just walking around. He basically just gave up. So he's definitely got something in his temperament, which you know, he he's got it in him to just kind of give up or you know talk back to a manager or give up on his teammates and not be very trustworthy. So. You would have thought well, United, listen, United maybe done the research up a bit more, but it's it, City, it's not... City don't very often let young talented players go. You know, we I guess the exception recently has been Cole Palmer, Cole and we're still probably yeah. thinking why have they done that. But they very rarely let a player that talented go. But he he made himself, you know, he, he made himself almost unpickable. You no, know, he, he was he was constantly throwing his toys out. He was saying, "I'm the main man. I should be in the first team." It's abandoned yeah. in a time when City are obviously investing. Millions in 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 players from all over the world. He was saying, "I want them Evan share. I want to be this. I want to be that." So you're right. It, it, it's it's the you know it's the second time that he's the, now the first time that happened. And he, he went to Dortmund. The fact that he kicked on at Dortmund's almost made that yeah. decision vindicated. Mm. But then when you go to another huge club and then you're yeah. seen to do the same, then you, I think I think it's got to be question marks over his over his temperament, big time, generally his mentality. Um, one player who will be thanking his lucky stars that he's got to move is, uh, I think, Eric Dyer. He somehow managed to fall out of favour with, with Ange at Tottenham and land himself in a Bayern Munich team that potentially could be the double. 
I'm what an really... agency he's got. God, you just be talking. I, I, I reckon, I reckon, I reckon he just said to Kane, look, what, what would make it up? Just go and buy, have you got any mates you <laughs> want to just bring along a bit? Like, I reckon Harry yeah. Kane comes training on his own. I reckon when he finishes training, he sits on his own in the canteen and yeah. he's like that, even the screwed. And then one day, they like, listen, we need to sort this out. You know, Harry, what can we do for you? Yeah. Do, do you got any mates you want to bring over? It's like on to that. Eric, 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 <laughs> and Eric Dyer has got a three and a half million pound move to buy in, and yeah, it's just to keep Kane yeah, happy. You got uh, two eggheads, two, two English eggheads, and then I am now. No, I know. So, yeah, great move for him. Um, another player which um, has been spoken about getting a move, whether he will or not, I doubt it, is Solanke. You know, I always forget he was at Liverpool, and um, I was really raised him at Liverpool, and I'm actually a bit surprised by the amount of noise coming up out of him now. I mean, he's having a great season. I think he's the third highest goal scorer. But people seem to have just really short memories when it comes to, like, football. Every yeah, other yeah. season, he has been shite every other season. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's, yeah. Done, I mean all, he's like, you have a good season and fair play to the lad. Yeah, a good season in the Championship. I, then, I okay, in the Premier I League, yeah. I, I wouldn't be going and spending, you know, 40, 50, 60 million on him. Um, but, yeah, he's one that's kind of coming for a bit. Um We'll quickly talk about just with brush over really because there's another leg to go. But yeah, in interesting results in the League Cup, Middlesbrough getting one over on Chelsea. I think Chelsea's still favourites to go through in the second leg. And Liverpool, you wouldn't say scraping past Fulham, but definitely gave them a scare. <laughs> definitely gave them a scare first half, you know, when it, it didn't take until maybe the last half an hour for us to actually, you know, start peppering their goal, really. But um, yeah, it was. Yeah, you know, I, I, listen. I... No, obviously I'm going to say this is an Evertonian and I guess way more of a neutral than you. Um, I thought they threw it away. They, they had a counter attack at, at 1-0. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Jeff was either Jeff was over reach or the squares it and it was a tap yeah. for Pereira. And he's deep. Yeah. Well, and then, yeah. you know, look, I, th I think credit to, again, credit to Klopp and credit to the team because he just went for it in that second half. He's threw yeah. caution to the winds. It was a risky... Strategy, you could say, because one nil's not a disaster. You know, it's yeah. not a disaster in the first leg, but it could have been two nil. But you know, it paid off as it often does. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, we, yeah, fingers crossed they'll go two in the second leg. I hope so because I've already booked my minibus down to Wembley, so I hope they go two. Um, I hope he's not then. Yeah, yeah, we no Liverpool game this weekend. Uh, obviously, Everton have got Villa. A really tough game, and I think it's going to make it even tougher if Luton managed to get a result at Burnley as that will put you in the relegation zone for potentially 24 hours until uh, until you play Villa. I think it's a massive game first off Burnley and Luton down in that relegation zone, and then it's going to be a tough ask, isn't it, for you, you guys to get anything off Villa as well? Yeah, I, I think um, I always give you a bit of a bit of an insight on here, you know, our opposition uh, podcast, and a lot of the time it's a bit of optimism for me. It wasn't this week. Um, Justin and the lads we, are, we had on from UTV, like a really big Villa podcast, and Justin spot on, very, speaks very well and, and knows his stuff. And the way he described the way they're playing and some of the individuals in, in the team and the system and, and where they're strong, it's going to be a, going to be a very tough game because I can't see. I actually can't see us getting anything this weekend. I've I predicted a draw on our podcast because I'd never like to predict the defeat. But if there's any team in in the in the Premier League at the moment that look like they have our number in, in terms of like just being bigger, stronger, faster better than us, it's Aston Villa. Yeah. No, it's going to be a tough game. The, the only other uh, standout game, I think, and we'll we maybe finish on this little debate, is uh, City-Newcastle. You've almost mm. got kind of um, two teams who are both on either end of financial fair play. One has benefited massively from it and one is actually, you know, you yeah, would say, yeah. Gonna, yeah, you would say initially when the, when the Saudis came in and took over Newcastle, you thought, well, this is Kind of Man City 2.0, which is going to be, you know, buying, buying the way. They haven't been able to because of financial fair play. And the owners have come out this week and said, you know, with a £17 million loss, you know, no one, no one player is not for sale. You know, they're open for business kind of all the time. And I just think with them, you know, ironic, they're both playing each other this weekend. It does pose, I think, or open up a bigger debate of just how fair is financial fair play because for years you've got. You know, it started with Chelsea and Abramovich, you know, seemingly just spending whatever they wanted. City coming in, spending whatever they wanted. And now you've got people buying football clubs who maybe have the money to pump in, you know, hundreds of millions or even billions in Newcastle's case. 
and are seemingly not allowed to. And it's almost a bit like, you know, and I know you're put Liverpool in this bracket, but you've got the top clubs who sit around the top table and, you know, they're allowed. No, nobody's well for me. It's like, a, it's like a mafia, isn't it? Like, you know, the families, the five families are here. And it's like, no, what are we going to do to make sure that we keep our position of power? And as you can imagine, that that conversation it didn't come up on our podcast with Villa this week, but off air, I was speaking to Justin about it. And he was saying that's what's really frustrating. He said, like, mm-hmm. we are actually in a position where we could kick on. But yeah. because we haven't got the commercial income, which is also driven by the fact that we haven't had years and years of success and blah, 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 we can never actually be it. We're never really going to be at that table. We have one good season, mm-hmm. but then we'd be forced to sell people to then move on again. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like... And I think the yeah. problem is, is, you know, you've had Man City where when it kind of wasn't, let's say, regulated or they weren't getting picked up, they were they were spending a lot of money on really big players, mm-hmm. right? So we already they're just starting ahead. So their squad value is, you know, maybe 10 times more than the likes of an Everton or a Villa. So then when these financial fair play rules get, you know, come into play, as a Villa or an Everton, you're almost banking or just, it's a, it's a wish and a prayer that one of your players has an unbelievable season and his value rises tenfold. And then you can almost then sell them, get the money in, and then that kicks you on because at the moment City have got these players now where they sell them. They're selling them for mega money because they already had them. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's like yeah, you say. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they've stockpiled all these assets. Yeah. And and they're all on loan and stuff and selling for 20, 25 million a time. Some of the players they're selling, they, you don't even know who they are. <laughs> no, no. And, and they're making that much money that they can then continue paying the big wages and getting the big players in where, like, so like I say, you know, you, I think for Villa, you'd probably need to sell your Ollie Watkins for mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, 60, 70, 80 million. Then buy, you know, two players worth 40 million each, hope that they kick on. And then you start, but that takes years and years and years. Ab City have proven, you know, this hasn't just happened overnight. They've had, you know, a long time of, of kind of overseas money coming into their team. And it's just, I'm, I'm imagining, yeah, really frustrating that Newcastle, the latest high profile team, to get these big investors, these big backers. And actually, I've got the hands tied. And, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm starting to kind of, you know, maybe come down to your level in the sense that financial fair play is is not so it's not very fair. <laughs> not very fair, is it? Not very yeah. fair. Yeah. Look, so look, some, some of ours was our own zero. Do you know what I mean? And, and there's mismanagement that comes into that. And I think, you know, I, I said it on I've said it on this podcast. I don't think us being punished was, was the wrong thing. I think it was right because the club deserves it how poorly they manage the money. No two ways about it. But. There's, there's a lot of stuff that went on there with a mitigating circumstances that, that really, if you go back, as you say, 10 years ago, it was not it was just a drop in the ocean compared to oh, what's yeah. gone on. Yeah. I mean, it's I know it wasn't under the same owners, but you it wasn't the same owners, but it almost affects them because they had that squad. But like, when Rubinho was signing for Man City, I mean, what the fuck was that? I know. That? I know. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it, it's it just all the stuff. It. I mean, you'd have to, you know, you could put the book's being written on it already. What's mm-hmm. going on? But I just, yeah, it's, and all that craziness can't happen anymore, which I suppose is a good thing in some ways, but it's definitely holding a lot of people back and keeping certain mm-hmm. clubs, you know, where they are, which is in the box. Yeah. Which is not good. But, um, yeah, mate, I think we've rattled through that. We've gone over as well, one hour ten. But hope you all enjoyed it. Um, yeah, lots to discuss there. Hopefully, those conversations will continue in the boozers over the weekend when you're talking to your mates. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to support our sponsors, IGD, for all your sports gear. Gary, massive thanks, mate. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And I'll see you, you next. See you, mate.